The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, chapters 5 and 6. Prostetnik Vogon Jeltz was not a pleasant sight, even for other Vogons. His highly domed nose rose high above a small, picky forehead. His dark green rubbery skin was thick enough for him to play the game of Vogon civil service politics and play it well, and waterproof enough for him to survive indefinitely at sea depths of up to a thousand feet with no ill effects. Not that he ever went swimming, of course. His busy schedule would not allow it. He was the way he was because billions of years ago, when the Vogons had first crawled out of the sluggish, primeval seas of Vogsphere, and had lain panting and heaving on the planet's virgin shores, when the first rays of the bright young Vogsol sun had shone across them that morning. It was as if the forces of evolution had simply given up on them there and then, had turned aside in disgust and written them off as an ugly and unfortunate mistake. They never evolved again. They should never have survived. The fact that they did is in some kind of tribute to the thick-willed, slug-brained stubbornness of these creatures. Evolution, they said to themselves, who needs it? And what nature refused to do for them, they simply did without until such time they were able to rectify the grosser anatomical inconveniences with surgery. Meanwhile, the natural forces on the planet Vogsphere had been working overtime to make up for their earlier blunder. They brought forth scintillating jeweled scuttling crabs, which the Vogons ate, smashing their shells with iron mallets. Tall aspiring trees of breathtaking slenderness and colour which the Vogons cut down and burnt the crab meat with. Elegant gazelle-like creatures with silken coats and dewy eyes which the Vogons would catch and sit on. They were no use as transport because their backs would snap instantly, but the Vogons sat on them anyway. Thus the planet Vogsphere whiled away the unhappy millennia until the Vogons suddenly discovered the principles of interstellar travel. Within a very few short Vog years, every last Vogon had migrated to the Megabrantis cluster, the political hub of the galaxy, and now formed the immensely powerful backbone of the galactic civil service. They have attempted to acquire learning. They have attempted to acquire style and social grace. But in most respects, the modern Vogon is little different from his primitive forebears. Every year they import 27,000 scintillating jeweled scuttling crabs from their native planet and while away a happy drunken night smashing them to bits with iron mallets. Prostetnik Vogon Jeltz was a fairly typical Vogon in that he was thoroughly vile and he did not like hitchhikers. Somewhere in a small dark cabin buried deep in the intestines of prosthetic Vogon Jelts, its flagship, a small match flared nervously. The owner of the match was not a Vogon, but he knew all about them, and they had a right to be nervous. His name was Ford Prefect. He looked about the cabin, but could see very little. Strange, monstrous shadows loomed and leaped, with a tiny flickering flame, but all was quiet. He breathed a silent thank you to the Dentrasses. The Dentrasses are an unruly tribe of Gormans, a wild but pleasant bunch whom the Vogons had recently taken to employing as catering staff on their long-haul fleets, on the strict understanding that they keep themselves very much to themselves. This suited the Dentrasses fine, because they loved Vogon money, which is one of the hardest currencies in space. 
but loathed the Vogons themselves. The only sort of Vogon that Dentrassi liked to see was an annoyed Vogon. It was because of this tiny piece of information that Ford Prefect was not now a whiff of hydrogen, ozone and carbon monoxide. He heard a slight groan. By the light of the match he saw a heavy shape moving slightly on the floor. Quickly he shook the match out, reached in his pocket, found what he was looking for and took it out. He ripped it open and shook it. He crouched on the floor. The shape moved again. Ford Prefect said, I bought some peanuts. Arthur Dent moved and groaned again, muttering incoherently. Here, have some, urged Ford, shaking the packet again. If you've ever been through a matter transference beam be before, you've probably lost some salt and protein. The beer should have cushioned the, the, your system a bit. Oh, said Arthur Dent. He opened his eyes. It's dark, he said. Yes, said the Ford Prefect. It's dark. No light, said Arthur Dent. Dark, no light. One of the things Ford Prefect had always found hardest to understand about humans was their habit of continually stating and repeating the very, very obvious. As in, it's a nice day, or you're very tall, or oh dear, you seem to have fallen down a thirty-foot well. Are you all right? At first, Ford had formed a theory to account for this strange behaviour. If human beings don't keep exercising their lips, he thought, their mouths probably seize up. After a few months' consideration and observation, he abandoned his theory in favour of a new one. If they don't keep on exercising their lips, he thought, their brains start working. After a while, he abandoned, abandoned this one as well, as being obstructively cynical, and decided he quite liked human beings after all. But he always remained desperately worried about the terrible number of things they didn't know about. Yes, he agreed with Arthur. No light. He helped Arthur to some peanuts. How do you feel? he asked him. Oh, like a military academy. Bits of me keep passing out. Ford stared at him blankly in the darkness. If I was to ask you where the hell we are, said Arthur, would I regret it? Ford stood up. We're safe, he said. Oh, good, said Arthur. We're in a small galley cabin, in one of the spaceships of the Vogon Constructor Fleet. Ah, this is obviously some strange usage of the word safe I wasn't previously aware of. Ford struck another match to help him search for a light switch. Monstrous shadows leapt and loomed again. Arthur struggled to his feet and hugged himself apprehensively. Hideous alien shapes seemed to throng about him. The air was thick with musty smells which sidled into his lungs without identifying themselves, and a low, irritating hum kept his brain from focusing. How did we get here? he asked, shivering slightly. Oh, uh, we hitched a lift. Excuse me, said Arthur. Are you trying to tell me that we just stuck out our thumbs and some green bug-eyed monster stuck his head out and said, Hi, fellas, hop right in. I can take you as far as the Basingstoke roundabout. Well, said Ford, the thumbs an electronic sub-ether signalling device, the roundabouts at Barnet Star six light years away, but otherwise, that's more or less right. And the bug-eyed monster? Is green, yes. Fine, said Arthur. Uh, when can I go home? You can't, said Ford Prefect, and found the light switch. Shade your eyes, he said, and turned it on. Even Ford was surprised. Good grief, said Arthur. Is this really the interior of a flying saucer? Prostetnik Vogon Jelts 
heaved his unpleasant green body round the control bridge. He always felt vaguely irritable after demolishing populated planets. He wished that someone would come and tell him that it was all wrong so that he could shout at them and feel better. He, he flopped as heavily as he could into his control seat in the hope that it would break and give him something to be genuinely angry about. But it only gave a complaining sort of creak. Go away! He shouted at a young Vogue on guard who entered the bridge at that moment. The guard vanished immediately, feeling rather relieved. He was glad it wouldn't now be him who delivered the report they'd just received. The report was an official release which said that a wonderful new form of spaceship drive was at this moment being unveiled at a government research base on Damagran, which would henceforth make all hyperspatial express routes unnecessary. Another door slid open, but this time the Vogon captain didn't shout, because it was the door from the galley, where the Dentrassi prepared his meals. A meal would be most welcome. A huge furry creature bounded through the door with his lunch tray. It was grinning like a maniac. Prostetnik Vogon Jelts was delighted. He knew that when a Dentrassi looked that pleased with itself, there was something going on somewhere on the ship, and he could get very angry about it indeed. Ford and Arthur stared around them. Well, uh, what do you think? said Ford. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit squalid, isn't it? Ford frowned at the grubby mattress, unwashed cups, and unidentifiable bits of smelly alien underwear that lay around the cramped cabin. Well, this is a working ship, you see, said Ford. These are the Dentrassi sleeping quarters. I thought you said they were called Vogons or something. Yes, said Ford. The Vogons run the ship. The Dentrassis are the cooks. They let us on board. I'm confused, said Arthur. Here, have a look at this, said Ford. He sat down on one of the mattresses and rummaged about in his satchel. Arthur prodded the mattress nervously and then sat on it himself. In fact, he had very little to be nervous about. Because all mattresses grown in the swamps of Scornchulus Zeta are very thoroughly killed and dried before being put into service, and very few have ever come to life again. Ford handed the book to Arthur. What is it? asked Arthur. It's the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's a sort of electronic book. It tells you everything you need to know about anything. That's its job. Arthur turned it over nervously in his hands. I like the cover, he said. Don't panic. It's the first helpful or intelligent thing anybody's said to me all day. Here, I'll show you how it works, said Ford. He snatched it from Arthur, who was still holding it, as if it was a two-week dead lark and pulled it out of its cover. You press this button here, you see, and the screen lights up, giving you the index. A screen, about three inches by four, lit up, and characters began to fl flicker across the surface. You want to know about Vogons? So I entered the name, and his fingers tapped on some more keys, and here we are. The words Vogon constructor fleets flared in green across the screen. Ford pressed a large red button at the bottom of the screen, and the words began to undulate across it. At the same time, the book began to speak the entry as well, in a still, quiet, measured voice. This is what the book said. Vogon Constructor Fleets Here is what to do if you want to get a lift from a Vogon. Forget it. They are one of the most unpleasant races in the galaxy. Not actually evil, but bad-tempered, bureaucratic, officious and callous. They wouldn't even lift a finger to save their own grandmothers from the ravenous bug blatter beast of Tral without orders, signed in triplicate, sent in, sent back, queried, lost, found, subjected to public inquiry, 
lost again, and finally buried in soft peat for three months and recycled as fire lighters. The best way to get a drink out of a Vogon is to stick your finger down his throat, and the best way to irritate him is to feed his grandmother to the ravenous bug bladder beast of Tral. On no account allow a Vogon to read poetry at you. Arthur blinked at it. What a strange book! How did we get a lift then? That's the point. It's out of date now, said Ford, sliding the book back into its cover. I'm doing the field research for the new revised edition. And one of the things to do is I have to include a bit about how the Vogons now employ Dentrassi cooks, which give us a rather useful little loophole. A pained expression crossed Arthur's face. But who are the Dentrassi? He said. Great guys, said Ford. They're the best cooks and the best drinks mixers and they don't give a wet slap about anything else. And they'll always help hitchhikers aboard. Partially because they like the company, but mostly because it annoys the Vogons, which is exactly the sort of thing you need to know if you're an impoverished hitchhiker trying to see the marvels of the universe for less than 30 Altarian dollars a day. And that's my job. Fun, isn't it? Arthur looked lost. It's uh, uh, amazing, he said, and frowned at one of the other mattresses. Unfortunately, I got stuck on Earth for rather longer than I intended, said Ford. I came for a week and got stuck for 15 years. But how did you get here in the first place, then? Easy. I got a lift with a teaser. A teaser? Yeah. Uh, what is that? A teaser? Oh, teasers are usually rich kids with nothing to do. They cruise around looking for planets which haven't made interstellar contact yet and buzz them. Buzz them? Arthur began to feel that Ford was enjoying making life difficult for him. Yeah, said Ford. They buzz them. They find some isolated spot with very few people around. And then they land right by some poor unsuspecting soul whom no one's ever going to believe. And then strut up and down in front of them wearing its silly antennae and making on the head and making beep beep noises. Rather childish, really. Ford leant back on the mattress with his hands behind his head and looked infuriatingly pleased with himself. Ford, insisted Arthur. I don't know if this sounds like a silly question, but what am I doing here? Well, you know that said Ford. I, I rescued you from the Earth. And what's happened to the Earth? Ah, uh, it's been demolished. Has it? said Arthur. Yeah, it just boiled away into space. Look, I'm a bit upset about that. Ford frowned to himself and seemed to roll the thought around his mind. Yeah, I can understand that, he said at last. Understand that? Understand that? shouted Arthur. Ford sprang up. Keep looking at the book, he, said. he hissed urgently. What? Don't panic. I'm not panicking. Yes, you are. All right, so I'm panicking. So what else is there to do? You're just going to have to come along with me and have a good time. The galaxy's a fun place. You'll need to have this fish in your ear. I beg your pardon? asked Arthur rather politely, he thought. Ford was holding up a small glass jar, which quite clearly had a small yellow fish wriggling around in it. Arthur blinked at him. He wished there was something simple and recognisable he could grasp hold of. He would have felt safe if alongside the Dentrassi underwear, the piles of squanchless mattresses, and the man from Beetlejuice holding up a small yellow fish and offering to put it in his ear, if he'd been able to see just a small packet of cornflakes. But he couldn't, and he didn't feel safe. Suddenly a violent noise leapt at them from no source that he could identify. He gasped in terror at what sounded like a man trying to gargle whilst fighting off a pack of wolves. Shh, said Ford. Listen, it might be important. Im important? It's the Vogon captain making an announcement on the Tannoy. 
You mean that's how Vogons talk? Listen. But I can't speak Vogon. You don't need to. Just put this fish in your ear. Ford, with a lightning movement, clapped his hand to Arthur's ear. And he had the sudden sickening sensation of a fish slithering deep into his oral tract. Grasping with horror, he scrabbled at his ear for a second or so, but then slowly turned goggle-eyed with wonder. He was experiencing the oral equivalent of looking at a picture of two black silhouetted faces and suddenly seeing it as a picture of a white candlestick. Or of looking at a lot of coloured dots on a piece of paper which suddenly resolves themselves into the figure six and mean that your optician is going to charge you a lot of money for a new pair of glasses. He was still listening to the howling gargles. He knew that only now it had somehow taken on some semblance of perfectly straightforward English. And this is what he heard. <laughs> Should have a good time. Message repeats. This is your captain speaking. So stop whatever you're doing and pay attention. First of all, I see from our instruments that we have picked up a couple of hitchhikers aboard. Hello, wherever you are. I just want to make it totally clear that you are not at all welcome. I worked hard to get to where I am today. I didn't become captain of a Vogon constructor's ship simply so I could turn it into a taxi service for a load of degenerate freeloaders. I've sent out a search party, and as soon as they find you, I will put you off the ship. But if you're very lucky, I might read you some of my poetry first. Secondly, we are about to jump into hyperspace for the journey to Barnard Star. On arrival, we will stay in dock for a 72-hour refit, and no one's to leave the ship during that time. I repeat, all planet leave is cancelled. I've just had an unhappy love affair, so I don't see why anybody else should be having a good time. Message ends. The noise stopped. Arthur discovered to his embarrassment that he was lying curled up in a small ball on the floor with his arms wrapped around his head. He smiled weakly. Charming man. I wish I had a daughter so I could forbid her to marry one. You wouldn't need to, said Ford. You've got as much sex appeal as a road accident. No, don't move, he added as Arthur began to uncurl himself. You'd better be prepared for the jump into hyperspace. It's unpleasantly like being drunk. What's so unpleasant about being drunk? You ask a glass of water. Arthur thought about this. Ford, he said. Yeah? What's this fish doing in my ear? It's translating for you. It's a babel fish. Look it up in the book if you like. He tossed over the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy and then curled himself up into a fetal ball to prepare himself for the jump. At that moment the bottom fell out of Arthur's mind. His eyes turned inside out. His feet began to leak out of the top of his head. The room folded flat around him, spun around, shifted out of existence and left him sliding into his own navel. They were passing through hyperspace. The Babelfish, said the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy, quietly, is a small yellow and leech-like and probably the oddest thing in the universe. It feeds on brainwave energy received not from its own carrier, but from those around it. It absorbs all unconscious mental frequencies from this brainwave energy to nourish itself with, and then excretes into the mind of its carrier a telepathic matrix formed by combining the conscious thought frequencies with nerve signals picked up from the speech centres of the brain which has supplied them. The practical upshot of all of this is that if you stick a babel fish in your ear, you can instantly understand anything said to you in any form of language. The speech patterns you actually hear decode the brainwave matrix which has been being fed into your mind by the babel fish. Now, it is such a bizarrely improbable coincidence that anything so mind-bogglingly 
useful could have evolved purely by chance, that some thinkers have chosen it to see it as a final and clinching proof of the non-existence of God. The argument goes something like this. I refuse to prove that I exist, says God, for proof denies faith, and without faith I am nothing. But, says man, the Babel fish is a dead giveaway, isn't it? It could not have evolved by chance, it proves you exist, and so, therefore, by your own arguments, you don't. QED. Oh dear, says God, I hadn't thought of that, and promptly vanishes in a puff of logic. Oh, that was easy, says man, and for an encore goes on to prove that black is white and gets himself killed on the next zebra crossing. Most leading theologians claim that this argument is a load of dingo's kidneys, but that didn't stop Ulon Kalufid making a small fortune when he used it as his central theme of his best-selling book. Well, that about wraps it up for God. Meanwhile, the poor Babelfish, by effectively removing all barriers to communication between different races and cultures, has caused more and bloodier wars than anything else in the history of creation. Arthur let out a low groan. He was horrified to discover that the kick through hyperspace hadn't killed him. He was now six light years from the place that the Earth would have been if it still existed. The Earth. Visions of it swam sickeningly through his nauseated mind. There was no way his imagination could feel the impact of the whole Earth having gone. It was too big. He prodded his feelings by thinking that his parents and his sister had gone. No reaction. He thought of all the people he had been close to. No reaction. Then he thought of a complete stranger he had been standing behind in a queue at the supermarket two days before and felt a sudden stab. The supermarket was gone. Everyone in it was gone. Nelson's column had gone. Nelson's column had gone, and there would be no outcry because there was no one left to make an outcry. And from now on, Nelson's column only existed in his mind. England only existed in his mind. His mind. Stuck here in this dank, smelly, steel-lined spaceship. A wave of claustrophobia closed in on him. England no longer existed. He'd got that. Somehow he'd got that. He tried again. America, he thought, has gone. He couldn't grasp it. He decided to start smaller again. New York has gone. No reaction. He'd never seriously believed it existed anyway. The dollar, he thought, has sunk forever. A slight tremor there. Every Bogart movie has been wiped, he said to himself. But that gave him a nasty knock. McDonald's, he thought. There is no longer any such thing as a McDonald's hamburger. He passed out. When he came round a second later, he found he was sobbing for his mother. He jerked himself violently to his feet. Ford! Ford looked up from where he was sitting in the corner, humming to himself. He always found the actual travelling through space part of space travel rather trying. Yeah, he said. If you're a researcher on this book thing, and you were on Earth, you must have been gathering material on it. Well, I was able to extend the original entry a bit, yes? Let me see what it says in this edition, then. I've got to see it. Yeah, OK. And he passed it over again. Arthur grabbed hold of it and tried to stop his hands shaking. He pressed the entry for the relevant page. The screen flashed and swirled and resolved into a page pr of print. Arthur stared at it. Oh, it doesn't have an entry, he burst out. Ford looked over his shoulder. Yeah, it does. Down there, see at the bottom of the screen. Just under eccentric... Kerr Galumbitz, the triple-breasted whore of Eroticon 6. 
and Arthur followed Ford's finger and saw where it was pointing. For a moment it still didn't register, then his mind nearly blew up. What? Harmless? Is that all it's got to say? Harmless? One word? Ford shrugged. Well, there are a hundred billion stars in the galaxy, and only a limited amount of space in the book's microprocessors. And no one knew much about the Earth, of course. Well, for God's sake, I hope you managed to rectify that a bit. Well, yeah, I managed to transmit a new entry off to the editor. He had to trim it down a bit, but it's still an improvement. And what does it say now? That mostly harmless? admitted Ford with a slightly embarrassed cough. Mostly harmless, shouted Arthur. What was that noise? hissed Ford. It was me shouting, shouted Arthur. No, shut up, said Ford. I think we're in trouble. You think we're in trouble? Outside the door were clear sounds of marching footsteps. The Dentrassi, whispered Arthur. No, those are steel-tipped boots, said Ford. There was a sharp, ringing tap on the door. And who is it? said Arthur. Well, said Ford, if we're lucky, it's just the Vogons come to throw us into space. And if we're unlucky? If we're unlucky, the captain might be serious in his threat that he's going to read us some of his poetry first. <laughs>